Lee Lu started off really strong in his recent fireside chat with Bruce Greenwald. He was asked, how has his investment philosophy changed over time? And his answer was pretty amazing. He said that basically his investment philosophy hasn't changed since he started. He has always pretty much innately understood that the best investments are ones where you're buying something for less than it's worth. One important note about that point is that the philosophy is relatively simple. I was just able to explain it in one sentence but the practice is where it really becomes difficult. So basically, Lilu's philosophy of value investing doesn't differ too much from Monish Pabrai or Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett. All intelligent investing is value investing. You are basically looking for something that is selling for less than it is intrinsically worth. And to me, that makes a whole lot of sense. The thing that does change though, isn't the philosophy, but the focus of the value. So for instance, back in the day, when Benjamin Graham was in his heyday, the balance sheet was the main focus for investors looking for great bargains. Nowadays, that isn't so important. I mean, of course, a good balance sheet is very important to a business's long-term success, but we're not finding as many big net nets or anything like that. What's more important is the business itself. And this is actually how Lilu started out his career. He was looking for the proverbial cigar butt investments, where you look at the balance sheet and if it's cheap on a quantitative basis, you ignore the business overall and invest in it. Now that's also how Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger and Benjamin Graham all used to conduct their business. But later on, Lee Lu started to realize the exact same thing that Warren Buffett and Charlie both realized, that it's more important to start to understand the actual operations of a business. I actually didn't know about this, but Lee Lu actually helped with a lot of startups. He mentioned that in the talk. And through this, he was able to really identify characteristics that make up good and bad businesses. Now, it's important for him to understand both types. You obviously want to invest in the good ones, but it's really important to understand what a bad business looks like so you know what to avoid. That may be almost as important as being able to identify a good business. So his experience with these startups helped him to realize that, hey, I need to look into these small businesses that I think I can understand really well. So he sort of evolved from investing in cigar butts to investing in quality businesses, even if they were big or small. So this is obviously the same transition we saw with Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, and now Monish Pabrai and Lee Lu. There's a common thread here. All of these great investors that I keep mentioning have had very long-term track records and success, and they've all evolved over time. So their focus of value has shifted from balance sheet quantitative approach to long-term compounders. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name is CJ. I hope you've enjoyed so far some of my takeaways from Lilu's recent fireside chat with Bruce Greenwald. Stick around for more key insights from Lilu about how to become a better investor, how we can think about investing in China, and general business investing advice. So Lilu went on to mention the types of businesses that he actually likes to invest in. And you might be able to guess this, but of course, it's the long-term compounder. So he's looking for businesses with strong, durable, competitive advantages, which we like to refer as moats, a term from Warren Buffett. And he looks for companies with a long runway of growth so that they can continue to grow and hopefully increase their scale to the point where competitors simply cannot catch up with the business. Li Lu actually said this throughout the talk many times. He said that the most important businesses have long runways with moats and high potential for growth. So keep that in mind when you're looking for a business. There are a lot of great tidbits that Li Lu talked about that I'll continue to touch on. So after Li Lu had started to mostly focus on long-term compounding businesses, great businesses, he decided like LeBron to take his talents elsewhere. And so he started investing in China and he's still doing that to a large degree today. So Li Lu basically went from being a refugee from China to accidentally attending a class at Columbia Business School that where Warren Buffett was giving a lecture, which happened to be Bruce Greenwald's class, to he didn't understand anything about business before he joined this class. And instantly he knew that what he wanted to do was investing. And now he's one of the most successful value investors and one of my biggest role models. And speaking of role models, if you aren't aware of Lee Lu's relationship with Charlie Munger. Lee Lu says that Charlie Munger is his number one role model. Now he, like Charlie, prefers to make role models of the eminent dead through reading books about history and all sorts of topics. But this time he is willing to make an exception for Charlie because Charlie is such an exceptional human. And the thing he most admires about Charlie is his rationality. 
he is able to, even in adversity, keep calm and think through the situation almost robotically so. And a funny fact about Lilu that I had never heard before is that before COVID, he actually had dinner with Charlie every Tuesday. And to this day, now that they can't meet together because of COVID, they still talk almost daily on the phone. So it seems like Charlie has become sort of not only a role model for, for Lilu, but also somewhat of a father figure, I would bet. So it's easy to see that they have such a close relationship um, you would be a fool not to want Charlie as your role model. Okay, so one more thing that Li Lu repeated over and over throughout the talk, which I think is really important for trying to think about evaluating businesses, especially when you're first getting started. And that is that the general long-term investment returns are going to closely mirror the returns of the actual business. So we're looking for great businesses with above average returns on invested capital. Now. Conditions like this, where a business is earning a high return, is naturally going to invite a ton of competition. We can take Alibaba, for instance. Uh, they've had a great success with their e-commerce business. And of course, there are a bunch of competitors entering the space, such as Pinduoduo and JD, just to name a few. But the truly exceptional businesses have barriers to entry and moats that protect them from these competitors and really protect their market share. So a simplified way to think about a company's long-term success is to consider their return on invested capital. Now, a company could have high returns on invested capital right now, but that doesn't mean that's always gonna be the case because of competition or other factors. So it seems that Lilu is basically saying companies with high returns on invested capital are in the long term going to do really well. But more important than that is their ability to sustain those rates of return. Exceptional businesses like Coke and Google have so far been able to maintain these returns. And I think we would all agree that Coke and Google are extraordinary businesses. I also wanna point out what Li Lu finds most interesting about business and investing in general. And that is that the fact that the only constant thing is business is constant change. Companies in favor now are not necessarily going to be successful tomorrow. It's hard to imagine a world without Amazon, but it is very possible in a hundred years, some other upstart could start to chip away at Amazon's business and actually overturn their dominance. It's completely possible and more than likely inevitable. That's just the way that uh, capital markets work. It's like a biological system. There's going to be competition and death and rapid growth and more death. That's kind of the way it works. And in today's climate where we have rapid change, especially with new technology, Li Lu believes that it's more important than ever that management be able to handle these rapid changes. And managements that aren't able to do so just go by the wayside and the company probably folds up. However, there are a few businesses where it doesn't matter who's running the business or what's going on. Now, it's critical for businesses that are able to constantly evolve. We need to look at how they're building their fortress, as Li Lu said in the talk, how they're building their fortress and how is it different from the competitors and how is that going to give them advantage over the competitors? Is the business's current edge truly going to be an enduring factor that will keep the business afloat for a long, long time to come. Is there a long runway ahead for this business? These are the types of questions that we wanna be asking when we're looking at evaluating businesses. That's a pretty good segue to start talking about what Lilu thinks are some good tips for either becoming a better investor or if you're just starting out investing, things that you should look out for. Okay, his first tip is something that he again repeated multiple times throughout the talk. He says that we must maintain intellectual honesty. Now there's nothing wrong with not understanding a business but there is something wrong with investing in a business that you don't understand. It's important for us as investors, for our long-term success, to be completely honest and rational about what we do understand and don't understand about the businesses we're investing in. And if there's something that we don't understand, we need to be upfront about that with ourselves and dive deeper. You can always continue to dig deeper, do more research, do more research. And if you finally do crack that shell, then go for it and invest but you can always do more research. And it kind of goes into the idea that we don't want to make mistakes of commission. We don't want to invest in a business that we don't fully understand and potentially lose a lot of money because we're just kind of taking a guess. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with missing out on an opportunity. I mean, Lee Lu says that part of the temperament of being a great investor is to not care whether your investment goes up or down 50%, or if people all around you are making tons of money and not everybody has these characteristics, but they are important qualities and you can develop them somewhat. 
as you go through your investing career. So don't lie to yourself because in all likelihood, you're just going to end up shooting yourself in the foot. Next up, which I think is a really valuable lesson to learn is to always think like an owner. Now I know Monish Prabhai says this and Charlie and Warren also. Adopt an owner's mentality. He gave this great little example of, imagine that your long lost uncle suddenly dies and you inherit his business 100%. So now you've just come into ownership of this business that you probably didn't even know existed. You don't know what the business does. So if you think about that before you start to study a new business, you go from having no knowledge of the business whatsoever to really wanting to know every single thing there is to know about the business. You wanna know the financials like the back of your hand. You wanna know who's running the business, who are the competitors, everything about the business. So if we wanna succeed in investing, then we should probably think like an owner. And his final piece of advice was always be a learning machine. Be a constant student of history, be learning about different industries and businesses. That's the only way that we're going to expand our circle of competence. Devote as much of your time as possible to reading and studying the history of great businesses and businessmen, because that'll really enlighten you to what a really good business looks like versus what a bad business looks like. You don't necessarily need to be an entrepreneur to learn about business, but it does help. So Li Lu didn't know anything about investing or business, but he did want to reiterate several times throughout the talk that you can increase your circle of competence if you have an intense curiosity about the world, about certain businesses, about everything. So basically, Lu Lu echoes the sentiments of all the greats, Warren Buffett, Charlie, everybody, that you have to be a constant learning machine in this business if you want to keep up and do well. I mean, I was so impressed by Li Lu's ability to spit out economic figures about China's GDP growth and specific sector growth. Uh, it reminded me of Warren Buffett a lot, who he can instantly tell you any, basically any number from memory. He can tell you baseball statistics. He can tell you the exact balance sheet for BNSF Railroad. I mean, they probably both have photographic memories. And it's evident that Li Lu obviously thinks about business a ton. I mean, a ton. It's really clear based on all of these insights from Li Lu that he's been heavily influenced by Charlie and Warren. And I'm really glad that we have such a leader in the value investing space to continue to look up to because Li Lu is still relatively young and I really can't wait to continue to follow him on his investing journey. He's a brilliant guy and you should watch this entire chat if you want to truly get the measure of this man. He also mentioned how it's important to be a generalist broadly. So we're excited to learn about basically everything. But once you decide on a business and are ready to look into it, you better become a specialist in that business. You need to know everything about that business. And again, this harkens back to his point about intellectual honesty. I thought this was kind of interesting about Li Lu. Bruce Greenwald asked Li Lu to elaborate on a point using a past example from Li Lu's past portfolios, but Li Lu flat out refused to use any past examples. He said he's not a big fan of this practice because people then will try to copy him. He said he'd rather teach a man how to fish than to give him fish. This is kind of in a stark contrast to Monish Prabhai's famous cloning principle. So I found that kind of interesting. Li Lu was kind of opposed to sharing past examples. And Monish Prabhai, on the other hand, is completely open about all of his past mistakes, successes, everything. Now, I don't know which philosophy is better, but I have found it really useful personally from learning about Monish Prabhai's specific mistakes and successes in investing. Whereas with Li Lu, we only have the general principles that he's sharing, which are obviously valuable, don't get me wrong, but we have heard them a lot from Warren Buffett, Charlie, Monish Prabhai, all the great value investors. But it is good to know that Li Lu is constantly thinking about these values and he obviously practices them if you look at his current portfolio and he believes in them wholeheartedly. But speaking of individual businesses, Li Lu didn't, of course, mention any specific businesses, but he did he did emphasize the importance of understanding these trends in the changes of technology. He talked about the history of technology and the trends going on there in the field right now. It all started off with semiconductors. And if you're not aware, he is invested in micron technology. Then the invention of these semiconductors eventually led to the rise of the internet. And then the rise of the internet has led to personal and mobile computing. Then the rise of personal computing has led to the almost instantaneous communication for everyone across the world. And that trend in turn has led to the rise of the data economy, which is now going to lead to more advances in AI. 
So that was kind of the general overview of how he has seen the trends of technology going forward. And he did say that we can approach this in one of two ways. We can either invest in the companies that are producing this technology, such as Micron, or we can invest in those who are leveraging that that technology and moving the world forward, such as big tech giants. So there, I think he was hinting a little bit at his position in Micron and how he sees the importance of semiconductors to the future trends of technology in general. And it did provide me a little comfort with Micron because he says, we, we don't need to understand semiconductors at a level that an engineer would actually understand them, but we do need to understand these sort of macro trends of how technology is going to shape in the future. And of course, this is really hard to predict, and there are a lot of easier other opportunities out there. But if you do want to go down that route, you should have a pretty good understanding of what you think the future will look like. I mean, I think that's kind of fun to think about, regardless of whether you invest in businesses like that. Okay, and finally, let's talk a little bit about investing in China. Now, this is a part of the video that I'm definitely gonna have to go back and rewatch and rewatch especially the more exposed I try to become to the Chinese markets. But his general feeling about Chinese markets and securities is that they're gonna be even more impactful in the future than they already are today. And on this point, he's not just talking about China, he's talking about all of Asia. The Chinese economy in general is still changing. Uh, a lot of the citizens are becoming middle class, so their needs are changing. Their needs are changing from just wanting to work and save to wanting to work, save, and consume. So there's this general trend towards a more consumption heavy population in China. So he firmly believes that China is one of the best markets in the world for value investors. He says that the markets are still generally underdeveloped and the government is slowly transitioning from being really heavy handed with businesses to trying to let the market be a little bit more free like we do in the United States, for instance. One example of the government and the regulators being more willing to allow this type of free market participation is that the government is trying to transition from an approval-based system where the government has to basically stamp the company's IPO and approve it so that they can go public versus a more registration-based system in the US. Li Lu thinks that the market is gonna slowly transition to more of a Western style of market, and that will only increase the opportunity for investors. We'll see a larger inflow of capital, for instance, and more opportunities showing up. One concrete example he gave in this case was the financial services industry in China. He says that the government has been acting in a way that they want the financial services industry to thrive in China, and they're making the markets more conducive for that. But again, he sees opportunities in every industry in China, some more than others, of course. If you wanna learn more about another great Asia-based business, check out my analysis and valuation of Nintendo over here. Let me know in the comments below if there's something I didn't cover that you wanna learn a little bit more about. Again, I wanna urge all of you to watch the video in its entirety. I'll have it linked down below in the video description. Uh, if you put it on double speed, you can get through it in about 45 minutes. And there are probably a bunch of nuggets of wisdom that I didn't cover in this talk. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you found this review of Lilu's talk helpful. I really appreciate you sticking around to the end and I will see you next time.